If you're joining me right now, it means you're uh, either being forced to watch this video or you're interested in learning something about compositing. Hello, my name is Devin Langston, and I am the senior motion graphic artist at Metro Productions, which is a video production company here in Richmond, Virginia. So today we're focusing on compositing. Uh, and I don't mean to insult you or assume anything, but I'm going to go under the assumption that you know nothing. So uh, if I say anything, and that goes for the tutorial part of this later on, if I say something that you already know, just go with the flow and feel good about yourself. But if this is helpful and useful and new information, well then that's awesome because that's the whole point of this thing. Um, and if you want to know a little bit more about the history of how compositing got started, I mean, it goes all the way back to the very beginning days of film. Um, I really recommend this video called Hollywood's History of Faking It, The Evolution of Green Screen Compositing um, by Filmmaker IQ. And it does a really good job of kind of explaining why compositing was invented, what the different techniques were, and gives you uh, the foundation for some of the terminology that they use. Um, and it also explains why green. So if you want to know about that, I recommend that video highly. Um, and if you've never done anything with green screen, if you've never set one up yourself, I also recommend this other video called Green Screen Tips, Tricks, and Materials Chroma Key Tutorial. Um, by Green Screen Systems, and this guy is a terrible public speaker. Oh my gosh, it's painfully bad to watch him on the screen. Uh, but the things that he's talking about are pretty relevant. So what I'm going to show you today is what I'd like to call down and dirty compositing, and that is the quickest way to get results on screen that look pretty good pretty fast. So uh, I definitely want to talk about green screen keying. As far as setting up the, the green screen, that's something that there are a hundred and a half uh, tutorials. No, there's more than, I bet there's more than 150 tutorials on that. Um, so we're not gonna go over that, but I will talk about green screen keying inside of After Effects. I'll also be talking about mats and masks, um, tracking, and color correction. So stick around and you should have a fun time with this video. So I'd like to show you a couple of examples. Um, in this first example here, I guess we'll start with the source material. So we got this box here, and I actually rigged this thing up with a piece of string that you may or may not be able to see right there, and cut the box so that it was easy to open so it looks like it opens on its own. Um, and then we have this guy here, and he was shot on green as well in the same studio. So you take both of those shots and pull the green out, and what you're left with is a guy inside a box. And of course we scaled him down so that he fit inside the box. Um, and there's still a couple of errors, but you'll see there's no more string. Actually, I think I do see the string a little bit right here, but got rid of the main, the main culprit there. So that's one example of just basic green screening. Uh, I got another one here. So we start with these guys. Filmed on a green screen here. I think this was shot 720. This isn't even HD. Um, one of the things that I mentioned that I'll mention before we even get into the meat of it, if you're trying to pull a green screen key on footage that is shot with like a DSLR or a lower end camera, like a consumer level camera, um, it's going to be a little bit harder than the high end stuff. And some of the reason that Andrew Kramer's tutorials look amazing and work on the first click is because he shoots with a red Epic. And uh, the difference is that there's no compression. It's a raw DNG um, file that's coming out of that camera. Um, this footage has compression, has all kinds of things that are attempting to make the file size smaller, but in doing that, it changes the way that the image looks. And when you're actually pulling the key on the edge here, you end up with some problems. But anyway, so we took this guy, these guys and this background plate that we shot right outside um, and then we got these 3D trucks. We couldn't actually buy one of these for real, especially not three of them. So we ended up, and here's what it looks like rendered. So this is a 3D render of some trucks. And when you take all of that stuff, I'm having trouble seeing my, there it is, and put it together, what you're left with is something. And actually, you'll notice I, uh, in addition to, so there's multiple layers of compositing going on here. You got your background plate, which has actually been blurred out. Um, I kind of darkened up the road a little bit right here. My guys are walking in the grass. There's a foreground shrubbery, and there's a little bit of a fake 
camera uh, camera move put on the whole shot to kind of make it seem more believable. Um, when you're compositing stuff, can't, that, that that fake camera move or even a real camera move will definitely help sell your stuff because people have less time to kind of analyze how the thing is fitting in the environment if the whole environment is bouncing around. Um, and this is actually a composite within a composite because that whole shot, the whole point of that shot was to go inside of this iPad. So there's a soldier here and he's spying on these guys who have got this fuel truck and they may be up to um, no good. So, so we have a whole composited shot that is then composited again into this iPad. If we look at the original shot for this iPad here, you can see there's nothing on the screen. And in fact, this was shot before any of us even had iPads. So, or 2008, is that right? I don't know. Um, and so it's actually just an OtterBox case with a piece of plexiglass inside of it. And uh, the problem with that is that the plexiglass is not flat, so you end up with these horrible reflections. And originally they were thinking that I could use realistic reflections from the shot to make my stuff look a little bit more realistic, but I ended up having to just completely get rid of that. I did, so this whole screen, even before you see something on the screen, is all fake. I mean, all the way, because the original shot here, it was shiny all the way through. So I've replaced it, the entire thing. Um, but I did try to add, you'll see just a little bit of a reflection sort of come across it or, or just a little bit of shininess. Again, all that's fake. And it just kind of gives the impression that that screen is moving a little bit. Also, there's no SD slot on an iPad. What is he doing? Also, where is he typing? Look at his fingers. What are, what is he, he's typing question mark Z question mark and an F shows up on the screen magically. Don't think about it too hard. So there's there's an example. Um, uh, a couple more for you here. Uh, I, I forgot this one here. So this is this is just a fun little thing that my coworkers and I did. And I don't have the original source material, but believe me, it was shot on green. So if you look real closely, I don't know if you'll see it, but let's just click through this one frame at a time. Uh, you can see that the video actually switches right there. So that's your loop point. So this is the start of the video. I actually started in the air. Then we're sitting there the whole time going through. And then I fake like I'm jumping. And by the way, if it isn't immediately obvious to you, I uh, did not jump that high into the air. And uh, <laughs> you can still see the shadows on my feet. So I, I probably should have gotten rid of those. But anyway, uh, you see it switch right there to a different video. So just made sure that I, when we filmed it, we got pretty close, and then I ended up doing, doing a little bit of time remapping to make um, everything fit in the exact same amount of time for each person. And that's how you can make it loop, looping. Um, I have an earlier example of that, which is not looping, but same idea, kind of enhancing what was filmed with a little bit of animation. And again, like, you could see my shadow. That's terrible. I should have definitely gone in and gotten rid of that. I don't know what I was thinking. But I did add a fake shadow in right here. So this whole, this whole ground shadow is completely fake. Um, but one of the things you can get away with is if you play it real fast and people only see it once, well, they'll, they'll follow the action with their eye and they won't be critical of all of the mistakes that you've made. That's what we're hoping anyway. And the last example I'd like to show you is actually something we're going to be talking about today uh, in After Effects. So this is for a show that our sister company, M2 Pictures, produces. It's called Monsters and Mysteries, and I get to put in the monsters. So um, it's, it's like an eyewitness recreation, you know, filmed really terribly, super dark and noisy and grainy, but um, that works for the effects sometimes. And again, like you see the you see the thing for two seconds, and then they cut away, so it gives you the impression. I mean, it just feels like there's something that's in the tree looking at you there. I wouldn't want that thing staring at me. Oh, he got angry and jumped out of the tree. So he's coming after the people, but he doesn't actually hurt them. Otherwise, they wouldn't be around to give their stories and have a show made about it. Okay, so I think it's time for us to go ahead and dive right in here. I'm on page number two. Um, so I'd like to take a look at that the, the easy shot first, which to me is the, the fuel truck. Um, so let's just like, let's just get started with how I would normally get started from scratch. 
Uh, now, first things first, before we even jump into After Effects, I just want to talk a little bit about project organization. Uh, it's very important to have a folder structure and to put your files where you know they're going to be and label them in a way that makes sense to you. Because, you know, future you, going back six months later, is not going to know what the heck SHOT2 means. But anyway, so once you've got your, your project folder, uh, you're going to start with the source folder. And inside of that, it's a good idea to separate out your VDIO and your audio and your images. Oh, did I? Yep. Yeah, too fast. And any other things like your docs, if you have documents, if someone gives you 3D models or you buy 3D models from where, these, these would be ones that your source is going to be stuff that you got from somewhere else. So I have 3D models here for getting models from somewhere else and not for stuff that I would create. Um, and that's the distinction I like to use. I also generally don't create that folder until I actually have a 3D model. No point in having empty folders unless it makes you feel better. Uh, doc would be for like scripts and uh, style, style guides and things like that. Anything that is research. And of course, inside of images and video, if there's something you're not going to be using, but you're just using it for reference, I like to make a ref folder and put the stuff in there just to distinguish it. And of course, the more complicated your project gets, you know, if you if you have like multiple scenes and you have all that, then organize from there. But for the most part, you want to separate the file types, at least for the sources that you're going to be getting um, in your main folder. I like to create an AE for After Effects. Some people put AEF or AFX. I don't know. It doesn't matter as long as you know that's your After Effects folder. Um, sometimes I'll do one. Well, I'll always do one for 3D if I have 3D. Uh, and inside of there, if it helps you, text is for your textures. Um, and that would be, again, like the difference between source images and 3D text. This would be for stuff that's actually being used by an object in my 3D program. So the distinction is sort of clear in my mind. Um, also inside of After Effects, um, I will create a pre-render folder when I need it, but sometimes, you know, to save you, to save your computer from having to do crazy calculations on like, you know, five minute long video that has hundreds and hundreds of layers with all kinds of effects, you can pre-render as you go uh, to kind of collapse your, your file down a little bit to make it render faster and then kind of replace those compositions. I also like to put a Photoshop folder and an Illustrator folder, again, only when I'm actually using those things, but there we go. So these would be Photoshop documents that I have either created or I manipulated one of my source materials. Now it's in Photoshop. Uh, Illustrator files are Illustrator files that I create. And that's how I do things. Um, feel free to adapt, adapt this to your needs, change it around, but the important thing is having your stuff all in one place. And one other thing I'll mention too, I have a stock folder that's got textures and you know pre-made 3D models and a couple other things that I end up using in multiple projects. But whenever I'm using that stuff, I always will copy that into my source folder. Um, because if you've got something on another, in another folder or on another hard drive somewhere and you're referencing that, if you ever save your After Effects project and forget to save that stuff, then all of a sudden you have unlinked media and it's going to be a huge headache to get that stuff back. So I always like to keep everything together. And if you're ever unsure, if you're inside After Effects and you're ever unsure that you have everything all in one place, you can actually do uh, a collect file, which is under dependencies. And I can't see that right now because I don't have anything in my project. If I create a folder here now, I think it'll let me do that. Yeah. Dependencies and collect files. And that will take everything that is in your project and put it all in one place and automatically organize it. Um, speaking of that, it'll organize it in the way that you have your After Effects project set up. So just like I do with my folders, I like to set up my After Effects project the same way. So I'll have a source folder and inside of that source folder, I'll put my video, my images, and I actually will do 3D, maybe that's a little bit different um, because now it's a source for inside of After Effects and not a source for the whole project, if that makes any sense at all. And Audio, I don't know why I can't spell that. There we go. 
and that's where I'll put all my stuff. If the project gets really complicated and has multiple scenes, you know, you got scene one and scene two and scene three, and they all have drastically different sources, um, rather than, you know, if you've got 15 scenes and you have video, multiple pieces of video for each of those scenes, this folder is going to get real filled up real fast. So I'll actually go and I'll duplicate this entire thing, right? So now I have a source inside of my scene. I can actually get rid of this. So now I have scene one and I have scene two, each of which have their own source folder. So everything that's in scene one is going to be in here. Now sometimes you'll have some spillover because you might want to use the same ground texture in multiple shots. And you could, I mean, you could you could either just borrow it and, you know, borrow from over here and just put it in there and, and you know, be okay with that. Or you can copy, you can actually copy your source and put it in here. And copying it, all that's going to do is create another instance reference to the original media. After Effects, if you don't already know by now, is non-destructive, which means that when you bring a file into it, unlike Photoshop, it's not actually a part of the After Effects project file. It is still a separate file on the hard drive that's simply being referenced by After Effects. Um, so, you know, creating a duplicate on your source here actually doesn't do anything except give you ease of, my, ease of your mind knowing that you have organized your project properly. Um, okay, so now that we've got our scene one and scene two, I'm actually going to delete scene two because there is no scene two in what I'm about to do. I'll go save as, and I'm going to find that project file or that folder that I just created, which I don't even know where I created it. How terrible is that? Oh, it's right on Dropbox. Okay, so in my Dropbox and VCU down in dirty compositing, After Effects, and I will call this the same thing that I called my folder, VCU down and dirty compositing. Uh, you could put a V1. I generally only start putting versions once I create another version, but there we go. So now I have my After Effects project. I've got a folder structure set up inside of the project that is similar, not exactly the same, but similar uh, to what I have going on in Windows. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and import and you can hit control I or you can just double click in this gray area um, and that will bring up your import window. So let's go back in and I've already moved my stuff into another folder because I am ridiculous. So uh, I take back everything I said about this whole down and dirty compositing thing. I'm actually going to save this where I have my source media already because I already created that folder. Sorry to confuse. Okay, what did I... I I should know what I called this. Personal KI class. It's more of a client thing, but hey. There we go. And I'm actually going to save this here. So VCU down and dirty compositing. And this is a specific shot that we're going to be talking about. So in this case, I've screwed all kinds of things because now I'm going to change exactly what's so KI class. And this is actually going to be the fuel truck shot. So that's what we're working on now. And the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and import the video footage. So again, I'll pull that up here. Source video. And nothing. That's because I lied to you. I'm going into my output for the original stuff because I'm all kinds of messed up. Do as I say, not as I do. So I've got, so let's see, so I've got my terrorist guys here. I've got a background plate. This is the final shot, I really don't need that. So let's bring those in right here. And I actually have the 3D render as well. Let's go back in here to 3D, fuel truck. And here we have the fuel truck. In addition to the fuel truck, um, you see that the, you know, the RGB pass just has, has a background on it. And all I want is the truck separated out. And since it's not on a green screen, um, I had to render a separate pass, which is the object's track mat. Um, Cinema 4D calls this object buffer. That's the same thing. It's a black and white image that defines where your other images are. And it looks like I didn't import an image sequence. I imported a still image. Make sure you have that selected right there. Um, here we go. So yeah, this, this is a black and white image that um, shows you where my object is. So whatever's white is where the object is and whatever's black is not. Uh, so I'm going to use that in just a few minutes to 
separate out my truck. Okay, so now I have my truck in here in here too. So this is a 3D truck. Okay. And a 3D truck track mat. Then I've got my background plate. There we go. It's moving around a little bit. And there we go. And I've got my terrorist guys. Okay. Um, so the first thing I'll do, I guess I'm going to go ahead and create a new composition. Now there's a couple ways to do this. You can go composition, new composition up there. You can actually hit this button right here, which will do the same thing. Or you can take the footage that you want to be the basis of your composition, drag it into this little guy right here, and it will create a composition that is the exact size, frame rate, and length of the video clip that you started with, which is fancy and helpful. And I actually don't really like this bump at the beginning here, so I'm going to hit Control B, or just B, uh, and that'll create the beginning point of my composition. We got a little bump at the end. This is also like 40 seconds. And I don't think mine needs to be that long, so I'm going to hit N here and I'll just trim the composition to the work area, and that that's going to make it just easier to see uh, to you know not not have this be the wrong length or start with something I don't want to start with. And there's also there's some sun and color variations in here that I'm not crazy about, but shouldn't be a problem. So the first thing I'm going to do is take my Iranian terrorists here and pull them into the shot and I'll take the pen tool and I'm actually going to draw a mask around the edge of the green screen here Boom. 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 so we've got our terrorist guys they're masked off and the reason I did that is because obviously outside of the green screen is not going to key so we only want what's in the green um, and that's, a, you know, I guess that's something that isn't immediately apparent when you're filming. You don't need to worry about filling the entire frame with the green screen. You just want to get the camera angle that you want to try to get because you're going to be removing everything that is not the green, that is not the, the subject, your dudes. All right, so let's just go ahead and get started. We'll go up to effect keying and then we're going to go down to key light 1.2. Okay, and what you want to do is kind of find an area of green that is about middle tone. Because you see, you know, this, this is not a perfectly lit green screen, so we have some lighter areas here. We have some darker areas here. Shadow there. You kind of want to get close to the person at about middle gray. So I think I might do right there. And you can see right off the bat, we got some pretty good results. But they're not great. They're not perfect. And especially since he was wearing green, it kind of made it a little more difficult. But what you can do to kind of see this a little bit better is instead of looking at final result, what we're going to want to do is go down to combined matte, and that's going to show you the black and white area of what's being keyed out, which is the black, and what's trans and what's opaque, which is in your white here. And you can see it's not perfect, not at all. You got some splotchy areas right here, and the edge is actually not that not that hard. So first thing I'm going to do is twirl down this little screen mat and look at this clip black value. So clip black will kind of determine where the black level actually starts. So when we slide this thing over you can see that all those little white gobbledygook areas get keyed out more and more and more and more. And the clip white is the exact opposite. That will take your opaque area and kind of make it make its range a little bit further than true white, meaning that colors that are not, that are further from green, I don't know what I'm saying here. All I'm saying is you move this slider and your object will re-emerge. Okay, and let's just look at the final result just to see. So that's already a lot better. Uh, and we bring up our background. Oh yeah, I think that's gonna work. So it's not quite Andrew Kramer good, but it's pretty close. And you know, you can either, have the background up while you're trying to key this thing, which makes the most sense because that's what you're actually going to be seeing it over. Or if it's helpful, I like to make a, a red solid or something that's drastically different than the green. Um, put that back there and then you can really see. Because sometimes when you're on this checkered background, you can't really see if there's like semi-transparent areas, but the red will usually help it show up. Also, in addition to that combined matte mode that shows you the black and white, there's also something called status. It's right underneath it there. And that actually will show you um, kind of more big 
chunks about uh, it, it shows you where things are happening um, kind of exaggerates the view that you're looking at so how to read this is the, the black is fully keyed um, the white is fully opaque the gray is semi-transparent and then so you can see there's a little bit of semi-transparency in his shadow and down there and then the green is the area that's been color corrected if you want to see what that's doing you can actually change this to intermediate result and let's just for a second let's turn off the red um, you can see that that when he's keyed the key looks nice you know the edge is, is um, pretty well defined but he's got a lot of green and that's just because it's semi-transparent and he's blending with the green that was behind him in that source shot so what key light does is it kind of looks at that edge it realizes that there's a green halo and on the final result it color corrects that image in order to make it not green and actually you can look at if you want to see what that's doing a little bit more clearly um, you can actually just look at corrected source so that so you have your source file and then corrected source um, is what's happening to get rid of that green now another little trick when we're on final result um, so you might notice that it looks a little bit dark around the edges and if we hit play on this you can actually see that there's a whole lot of like crunchy noise going on it's the only way I can describe it the the, the blacks look dancy uh, and I found that not always a hundred percent of the time but but often I can use this little replace method and I can change that to hard color and you'll see that instantly it gets a little bit lighter uh, and it also ends up getting rid of a little bit of noise. Now he's still kind of noisy, um, but let's see what the difference is on this guy. So there's with your soft color, and you, it seems counterintuitive because the soft color actually produces a harsher result, and the hard color, and it just feels to me, especially in the sunlight out here, like it blends a little bit better. So the soft, again, is making it like really kind of dark, hard edges, and the hard color just um, it lightens everything up. A little bit makes the noise not so bad all right also since there's it's worth mentioning too that there are two guys in this shot if this guy had like curly hair or just something on him was not keying as well and you needed to use two different settings there's no reason you have to do these guys together I mean, you can pull your mask over here and just deal with one guy at a time if you want to you know just Control D will duplicate the layer. It's still got that key light effect on it, so now I just pull that over, and now I have my guys separated out, um, which is actually handy, you know, because we're in After Effects, which means you can move these layers anywhere you want to. Um, so instead of just being satisfied with the shot that was given to me, you know, I can now move him anywhere I want. In fact, let me go and scale these guys down a little bit. We want to make this whole area seem like it's bigger. Okay, so there's my guys. And let's just see. He's probably going to walk outside this mask. Yeah, he is. There we go. Let's make this mask a little smaller there. Don't go too far. Oh, his gun goes out. Okay, not a problem. Not a problem. Let's go through that whole shot and just make sure he stays inside of that mask and he does okay so we're good on that next thing I want to do um, is I think I want to make them look like they're in the grass because right now it just looks like they're on top oh also did you kind of see that the camera is bouncing at the beginning of the shot I just noticed you see that the whole the whole camera move is bouncing so they're bouncing up and down and it's a good thing they shot extra because otherwise that might be difficult to deal with. I'd have to get rid of that bounce before I could move on. But so we're good on this shot starting right here. So I think that's what I'll use. Now, the next thing I want to do is I want to make it look like they're walking in the grass because right now it looks like they're on top of the grass, especially since there's a shadow right there. And I, you know, it's like I could go in and get rid of this shadow by either messing with the key settings or, you know, putting a mask that animates along with his foot. 
but I don't want to deal with that right now. Instead, what I'd like to do is actually just take this background layer, duplicate it, bring it up on top, and actually sometimes I'll, I'll bring down the opacity just so I can still see what's underneath. Or, or just put it underneath for now, either way. And, um, and then what I want to do is kind of draw myself some grass. And, you know, you can be as precise as you want to about this. I'm kind of doing it down and dirty because, as you'll see in just a second, you can kind of get away with a lot um, when it's tiny. Oh, that was a big piece of grass right there. Oh, that wasn't even, that was a flat, it was a grass plateau. All right, let's just go a little bit further here. Boom. And I'm actually gonna change the mask feather to like one or two. Okay, now it didn't look like I did a whole lot just yet, but actually, oh, by the way, um, once you have your mask selected, you'll have all the points selected so it'll be moving the entire mask. But if you click and drag, you can select just a single mask point. Now, if you don't have any mask points selected and you try to click and drag, that's going to move the whole layer. That's going to, you know. So you want to click on the point. Now you have a mask selected. Now you can drag. You can drag around those points. And you can actually control T to bring up your transform tool. And now you can transform stuff just like you do in Photoshop. Rotate it, scale it, anything you want to do. Um, so I was actually going to go in and grab all of these guys right here. Control, tree, control T to kind of bring this down, and then I'm going to bring all of this up. And I forgot the fact that I made the opacity 43%. Bring that back up. And then that's kind of extreme, but boom, he looks like he is in that grass. Let's move this down just a little bit here so you can still see some of his feet. And I guess I'm going to turn the feathering back up to two. You know, if I... If I did this grass in Photoshop, it probably would look a little bit better. You don't want to have your blades be too thick like mine are. But you get the idea. There we go. I'll buy it. I'll buy that for a dollar. Now, so I'm going to take this whole mask and on the same layer, so this is just my foreground, foreground plate, I'm going to duplicate this mask and bring it over to this guy and do the same thing. And now it looks like these guys are walking in the grass. Now it looks like he steps out right there. So I'm actually gonna move this over just a little bit more. Oh yeah, it looks like they're in that grass. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'm gonna go and, excuse me, I'm gonna grab my trucks. And actually, before I do that, um, I kind of want to extend this field a little bit more so it doesn't feel like there's a hill right here that drops off into nothingness. So I'm going to take this layer and actually move it up a little bit um, and pull this down as the bottom layer. So now my bottom layer is moved up. The layer right above it is still where it was originally. We are going to just kind of draw around this hill. Probably even that out right like that. And boom. Now I'm going to feather this mask a little bit. And I actually don't want to feather left and right because that'll, that'll, you know, take up the edge here, or the edge of the screen. So I want to unlink these. And now I can just scale just vertically, which is what I want. Um, and since I've feathered, I said scale, I meant feather. And since I've feathered um, up a little too much, I'm actually gonna go and just pull this guy up right here, like that. I think my background layer probably went a little too high, but there you go. So now it looks like there's a little bit of a seam there, and that's just because my mask is kind of at the wrong point. Now, if I don't have anything, maybe that's what I want in this case, because it just makes it look flat. If you want to kind of give the impression of a little bit of a hill going to the background, you kind of do it like that. And now it feels like there's a little bump. I don't like that. I don't like it at all. I'm going to leave it. Um, there we go. And in this case, I mean, heck, you can even take one more layer of this 
uh, take the mask layer, take the mask points off, drag this over here, and kind of steal some of that grass. Boom. And be sure to feather it like that. There we go. Turn that on and off. I don't know if that's necessary, but yeah, you know, you can you can play around. And obviously this is the same piece repeated over here, so maybe I'll even do the same thing over here so I can kind of make that look a little different. There we go. Now we get something that's a little bit different than what we started with. And I have to be careful. I'm actually fading off into the tree line a little bit right here. It starts to get sloppy. So just imagine, you know, you can, you can go a lot further with this matte painting technique and kind of create different elements in the background to extend your scene a little bit. But I'm pretty happy with that right now. So the next thing I'm gonna do is grab my fuel truck. And uh, one thing to check out, when you are importing an image sequence, which is what this is, you need to make sure that your image sequence, first of all, was animated and also brought in at the right frame rate. Um, so my background layer was shot at 23.976. Now that's not 24. 23.976 is a different number than 24. It will be noticeable after several seconds if you get that wrong. Uh, but these are both at 23,976. It looks like my f my animation is at 30. So I actually don't want that. Um, if it mattered what the animation was doing, I'd probably go back into my 3D program and I would re-render that differently at a different frame rate. In fact, let's check that just to be sure. Um, control D, and I actually did. So frames per second, 24 seconds, and I'll look at my render settings. 24 frames per second. So in this case, I rendered this thing correctly, but I didn't interpret it correctly inside of After Effects. So if I was doing anything that was lined up with time, I would notice that this thing was way too fast and I wouldn't know why. And that's because it's being interpreted at 30 frames a second. So I'm gonna go to interpret footage, main, and I'm gonna type in 23.976. And all that's doing is it's making sure that when it reads those frames in, it's playing them back at 23.976 frames per second. Not changing, it's not changing any of the frame information, it's just changing how quickly they change. <laughs> okay, so I've got my fuel truck here and I'm gonna drag that in. Whoa, I forgot. Oh wait, no, we're good, Never mind. We're good, okay. And the next thing I'm gonna do is drag in my object buffer, which I also, no, oh yeah, I already interpreted that correctly. Now, so you'll see this thing down here called track mat, which if you watched that, uh, what video was it? The Hollywood's history of faking it, evolution of the green screen. Um, you will know what a track mat means, or what that stands for, but we're gonna take this track mat, and what we're gonna do is set this to luma mat. So what that does is it takes the black and white information of the video layer right above this layer, and whatever's white shows up, whatever is black is transparent. And to prove that, I am selecting the object track mat, which Cinema calls object buffer, and I can move that around and you can see that those trucks are being revealed only because this black and white image is showing where those trucks exist. Uh, if you wanna get fancy, and I do, grab both of these things and what is it, Control, Shift, C, or you can also just right click on it, I think, and go to, I never right click, and I, I even forgot how to, pre-compose, here you go. It's funny that it doesn't have the keystroke next to that. You go pre-compose, and I am gonna call these fuel truck. And this is another example where if you have a really complicated s setup in your After Effects project with a bunch of stuff, label this accordingly. You know, if you wanna call it shot one fuel truck pre-comp, it'll never hurt to put more information on this stuff. Um, Another little quick thing, if you only have a single layer and you're doing this, you'll be given the option to leave all the attributes on it. So if you have a mask or effects or anything on your layer, 
Um, generally, if you're pre-composing, you want to move everything inside the pre-comp. There are reasons you'd want to leave it here, but just so you know the difference between those two. Um, so I'm going to hit OK. And what you end up with is now a single layer that has both of these layers inside of it. Boom. Uh, these trucks are on top of my dudes, so I'm going to move these down a little bit. Okay, now my dudes are in front of the trucks. Those trucks look tiny compared to these guys, so I'm actually going to make these guys even smaller. Let's see. There we go, kind of still stick them in where that grass is. If I need to move the grass around, I will. Yeah, let's actually, so this guy, and the nice thing about separating these two now is that there was, there was a little bit of perspective in that, in that original shot. You know, he's not actually that much taller than this guy. There's just perspective, um, but I can, there's not as much perspective in this shot or it doesn't look like there is to me so I'm kind of scaling him up so that now he's sort of the same size as this guy and heck if I was you know going all out I might make another version of him over here color him differently re make the guy change clothes and we'll put him in the background here behind this truck you know so there's so there's lots of guys in the scene does he look like he's behind that truck I don't know anyway um, but my trucks don't really look like they're on anything exactly so once again I'm gonna kinda take part of that background duplicate it I'm gonna put it on top of the truck move my grass and stuff up Whoa. I just move the whole, whole frame around and let's do this whole thing with grass and if you wanna see you want to see this more clearly so you can actually see what you're doing just turn you know just solo the layers that you're looking at so I, I want my fuel truck and I want this grass that's what it's all about here just just enough to make it look like these wheels are actually going behind something like that there we go I'm pretty happy with that the last thing I'll do, so this edge down here is not going to blend well. It might, but it might not. Yeah, so you can kind of see that stair step. So the last thing I'll do is actually take this layer, and I'm going to draw one more mask that's sort of like the one I tried to have originally. Um, either that or actually, actually, I'll just take these bottom mask points here. Down and dirty means sometimes you get a little sloppy with it. There are some people who will be yelling at me right now. All right, so you just bring this down a little bit. And you still have the stair step problem, but what you can do is kind of, whoops, I'm accidentally drawing a shape layer. If you don't have anything selected and then you start drawing, it will create a shape layer. And shape layers definitely have their purpose, but um, not for right now. So, let's try this again. I have the layer select, I've created a mask. Feather. And I'm gonna change this one to subtract. And let's just feather that off here. And actually, we'll move that entire mask, whoops, just the mask, not the layer, down a little bit. Now, that should bend, should blend much more nicely. Beautiful. All right, so now we have our, let's just go through these layers here so we can see what we're dealing with. So we have our background layer, which we have created out of the background layer, kind of duplicated on top of itself to extend it a little bit further and get rid of some, what I saw as unpleasant trees. And that goes, that's true if you have like a piece of trash or trash or something in the background that you couldn't get rid of a sign, that's a perfect way to get rid of that. Um, then on top of that, we have our fuel trucks. Um, on top of that, we have another little layer which kind of pushes those fuel trucks in behind the grass just a little bit. Um, I have a red solid for no particular reason anymore, so I'm going to get rid of that. I have my terrorist one, terrorist two, and the grass in front of them. The next thing I'm going to do is create a new adjustment layer 
which is Control Alt Y. By the way, Control Y creates a solid layer. Um, and we're going to take this adjustment layer, which allows you to make changes um, to every layer underneath the adjustment layer. So I'm pulling this adjustment layer down underneath the truck, so it's right in front of the, the bottom most layer, which is our grass. And all I'm going to do is, well, first thing I'm going to do is draw another mask on the adjustment layer. Boom. And I'm going to go to effects, color correction, levels, and kind of bring this median value up. And all that's going to do, let me feather this mask while I'm at it. All that's going to do is kind of just create a further separation. Now it feels like I should pull these trucks down a little bit. Oh yeah, 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 that feels a lot better. Um, and let's see what we're working with here. So yeah, it kind of makes it feel like there's a little bit more of a path. Um, you could totally take this to the next step and actually get source imagery um, of a dirt road and kind of put that in there. But this is good enough for my purposes for now. There is example number one. And of always, save your work. Brilliant. Anyway. So yeah, I'd like to propose a challenge to you. Uh, if you've never done a five second project before, now is your chance. So the assignment I'd like to give to you, uh, let's let's call it a, a project challenge because assignment is something, something I don't like about that term. Uh, your project challenge is a five second compositing based project with the emphasis or with the, let's, re let's re rephrase this a little bit here. Now I would like to propose a project challenge to you a five second project that features compositing with the theme superhuman. So anything you want to do, show me something and I will show you my five second project which is actually a little bit longer than five seconds, I cheated. Uh, so here, without further ado, is my not so five second long, five second long project. These things are always cool if they loop too and mine does not loop. But oh, oh, I almost gave it away. View, loop, let's go back here. This really needs some sound design too but there you go. Oh, look at my big flabby gut. It's fantastic. But now, the challenge is on you. I'd like you to go out there and think of an idea that you can film either on green screen or just in the street or wherever you want to do it to set up five second long video, superhuman, using compositing. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you found this information exciting and useful. And I hope that you go out there and do some compositing of your own. I'm Devin James Langston. Dogs! Seriously, you're humping each other? You're both males. You're, you're both male dogs. I don't know what to say. Bye, everybody.